2020 virtual AJC Decatur Book Festival, presented by Emory University. I'm Natalie Green, the Public Programs Manager at the National Book Foundation. We're so proud to partner on this evening's event. Many, many thanks are due to, due to Joy Pope, who constantly exemplifies patience, grace, and creative gusto, and her whole incredible team for making all this possible. And thank you for joining us. Since 1950, the National Book Foundation has presented the National Book Awards to honor the best literature in America. Over the past couple of years, we've expanded our education and public programming, working year round to reach readers everywhere. We've donated over 1 million books to public housing authorities and visited 40 states across the country to open up access to National Book Award honored authors and their work. We're sad to put our in-person programming on hold like most everyone, but so appreciative of these opportunities of gathering virtually together as we look ahead to our 71st annual National Book Awards this November. We steadfastly believe that books matter and the organizations behind the books matter. If you're able to, please consider donating at nationalbook.org. This evening's event, NBF Presents Reckoning with Resistance, will feature 2019 National Book Award longlisters Hanif Abdurraqib and Kamon Felix in conversation with Eve Ewing. Please, please buy all three of these authors' outstanding books. With gratitude to our bookseller partner, Cherish Books and More, the oldest feminist bookstore in the United States. For tonight's program, Hanif and Kamon will give us a taste of their work, and all three of our lovely guests will chat for a bit before opening up to a few questions from the audience. Feel free to pop those into the chat bar throughout the conversation. And without further ado, Hanif Abdurraqib is a poet, essayist, and cultural critic from the east side of Columbus, Ohio. His latest books are Go Ahead in the Rain and A Fortune for Your Disaster. Kamon Felix is a poet, writer, speaker, and political strategist. She received an MA in arts politics from NYU, an MFA from Bard College, and has received fellowships from Kaveh Kahneman and Poets House. Her first, but most certainly not last, full-length collection of poetry, Build Yourself a Boat, was long listed for the 2019 National Book Awards and was a finalist for the 2019 Lambda Literary Awards. Kamon was the director of surrogates and strategic communications at Elizabeth Warren for president and is now the VP of Strategic Communications at the agency Blue State. And our moderator for the evening is Dr. Eve L. Ewing, a sociologist of education and a writer from Chicago. She's the author most recently of the poetry collection 1919 and the nonfiction work Ghosts in the Schoolyard, Racism and School Closings on Chicago's South Side. Her first book, the poetry collection Electric Arches, received awards from the American Library Association and the Poetry Society of America, and was named one of the year's best books by NPR and the Chicago Tribune. She is the co-author with Nate Marshall of the play No Blue Memories, The Life of Gwendolyn Brooks. She also currently writes the Champion series for Marvel Comics and previously wrote the acclaimed Ironheart series. Ewing is an assistant professor at the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration. Her work has been published in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New York Times, and many other venues. And I'm pleased to say, take it away. Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, my name is Eve Ewing, and I'm here with my dear, dear friends, Kamon Felix and Hanif Abdurraqib. And we are really thrilled to be spending time in conversation with you this evening as part of the Decatur Book Festival um, and welcoming you from wherever you may be joining in with us tonight. Um, I am privileged to be able to ask a few questions of, Han of uh, Hanif and Kamon this evening, but also you'll have a chance to ask them great questions if you wanna do that. So throughout this evening's event, if you wanna use the ask a question feature, and uh, hit that button, you can put your question in there and uh, hopefully we can get to it when we get to the Q&A portion of the evening. Um, okay, friends, so uh, time is gonna fly. So I wanna start us with um, just a question of like, number one, how are you doing? And are you able to write these days? Are you writing? Have you been writing? I feel like oftentimes at these events, uh, we're all kind of circling these notions of productivity that aren't really fitting a lot of our lives right now. So maybe we can just start with that. Like, how are you doing and are you writing or not? I am 
doing I'm, I'm doing, I, that's really it, right? Like that, that's actually the only status update is that I am more productive than I've ever been and not in a way that I necessarily enjoy. I think that like the, the reality of having to be home all of the time and in front of our computers requires a certain level of productivity that like, I don't know, that I don't know is like intentional or, or even curated. It's just, we're all just sort of working and I'm trying to get used to that um and because of it like I'm not I'm not really writing I mean I'm writing but like it's not the work that I want to be working on I want to be working on my books and instead I'm like writing essays in the middle of the night for like random thoughts that come to me because it doesn't feel like there's any other place for them to go they just sort of like live with me and I got to get them off me um so this limited space and um limited ability to to move and be flexible I think has like definitely altered my ability to write what I want, but but is pushing me to write something. And maybe in a couple of years, I'll be grateful for that push. But right now it's a little frustrating. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that people who know me and have been around me at all have heard me um, kind of rage against the capitalist notions of productivity that are often kind of hoist upon artists. Um, and so, you know, I think I've always had adaptable ideas around productivity. And the thing that I often say is that I'm like five other things before I'm a writer um, and in order for me to write effectively. Sorry, I'm laughing because around this time every day, somebody drives down my block playing like old cash money songs and it's happening again. And I'm so happy. Um, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm like, five, I gotta be five other things before I'm a writer. You know, we all are other things beyond our art. And um, in order for me to be productive in a, in a traditional sense, I have to really get to the productivity of, of cultivating affections in those other areas. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to be a good sibling or a good dog owner or a good record collector or a good sports fan or a good member of a group chat, you know? Um, a good friend, I think is the easy thing. And so, I, you know, um, sometimes if I'm not pulled in the direction of writing, I am pulled in the direction of a phone call that is a check-in with someone I love. And mm -hmm. through that check-in, I am given the world in a renewed way. Um, but the phone call is a production, right? And the writing is just the end result of that. Yeah, that's so real. I, I think like maybe two years ago, I started thinking about what it would look like if I brought the same kind of systematic way that I approach my work into my relationships, right? Which is that like, you work on them a little bit every day and you set goals and, and it makes me wonder, are there other things that you all are producing and making or creating or putting into the world right now that are really important to you that might be outside the bounds of what people expect you to be producing? Like, what are you making that is bringing you joy mm -hmm. or that feels important to the world? I feel like you should pop in first. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, um, I have uh, revised my skincare routine twice now during during uh, the pandemic, and I feel good about where it's at. And so I guess it's a type of making, um, but it's working out well. My skincare and beard care routine, because I think if for those who have beards, you know, you can't like do one and not do the other. Uh, it's kind of just like putting rims on a bad vehicle. <laughs> uh, Which many people do, Hanif. People many, put many people rims do. on fugly cars, but. <laughs> but beards, I mean, we don't I, don't, I won't get into this whole thing, but beards are like gross and uh, unpleasant by nature. And I think you have to do the work of, anyway, I'm also um, getting back into piano playing now, mm -hmm. but muscle memory is wild, right? Because the only songs that my brain knows how to play are like old, spiritual black gospel songs, which is why I didn't grow up in a church or like early mid 2000s emo songs. So it's either like I'm playing Roll Jordan Roll or I'm playing The Spill Canvas and there's nothing in between. But I, I think having the ability to kind of work my muscle memory along that way has been good. So are you saying that we're gonna get a dashboard confessional Mavis Staples mashup album from you anytime soon of just <laughs> Yeah, Mavis uh, Staples, if you're out there, if you're listening, if Jeff Tweedy is out there listening and anybody yeah. wants to make that happen. Please do. Come come record me. At my house. 
Kimon, what are the things that you, you said that there's things that you want to be working on? What are the things that you want to be working on? And then you can tell us also some of the things that you are making that are maybe not traditional production. Yeah. So I am working on um, a manuscript, a book about um, how we employ new political philosophies inspired and informed by Black poetics. Um, and it's been really hard because like my, the way that I understand and have learned poetics and have come to be trained by it is just through experience, right? Just like being in conversation with people in spaces, like of course reading, but more importantly, like just talking about what I'm reading, right? And getting inspiration from the people around me and, you know, being limited and limited in this way, not really being able to like leave the house or find opportunities to like really curate those kinds of conversations has really made it hard. Like I, I think in some ways, this is a, a good thing. And a thing I've been grateful for is that I cannot think or write without community. Um, and I think it is like healthy that I've cultivated that as a crutch. Um, it's a healthy crutch, but in this moment, it means that like I, the train has just stopped um, because I'm, I'm, I don't think that I'm doing a good job at cultivating that community offline. So to, to your other question, even like, well, what, what else are you doing? Two things. I, it's interesting that what you said about like setting goals for relationships and trying to actually like be systematic and strategic about them. Um, I'm doing a lot of that, like really evaluating where are the spaces where I've just like let some relationships lag and like, how can I be intentional about closing that gap, which I think will serve in the long run of figuring out how to build that community offline. Um, and also because I spend so much time looking at myself, <laughs> I, I feel like we all do this, but every couple of years, I'm just like, okay, I did an entire wardrobe shift, like my entire who I am and how I enter the world has to be different. So I'm spending a lot of time figuring out like what that is, like when we come out of, of Corona, like who will Cam be? And so I'm like trying this like face jewelry stuff and getting like a, a little bit more into punk, like the way that I was when I was a young person, I'm shopping a lot at Dolls Kill, which please, like if they have some ethical or moral like failures and faults, please don't tell me right now, but. Oh no, we can have a conversation later. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I knew in my head, I was like, don't say, the minute you said Dolls Kill, I was like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Okay, well, I've only spent 100. It also sucks because you can't thrift. You can't thrift right now, really. That's a real, unless you do the internet. Safia is really good at the internet thrifting, but. He is really good at the internet Hanif thrift. is also really good at the internet thrifting. I need to be better at the internet thrift, but but it's true. It like, it, to go back to like grungy, emo, you know, middle school me, I would just go back in time, which is what a thrift yeah. store does. And now I can't do that. So I'm shopping at Problematic as Dolls Kill, which now I'll never shop at again. Thank you, Hanif, so much. I'm I fucked up. In my oh, head, I was like, don't do it. But it's, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad and you're, I will say, come on, I'm, I'm glad you're going back to your, to your emo grunge self. We all yeah. deserve that, I think. Me too. Someone asked me on Instagram the other day, like, are you still jamming a Green Day? And I was like, do I admit this or do I like Yes. And I yes. Like, yes, I do. Yes. It's the best album that was ever made and I stick to it. Yes. That's Honey. amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, okay, so we did not ask you all to read, um, but I'm going to cheat because I'm going to read a little bit of some of y'all's work um, because I can do that. So um, Hanif, in A Fortune for Your Disaster, which recently won a very important award from the American Academy of Poets, so we should all snap it up for you. Um, you have several poems that are all titled, How Can Black People Write About Flowers at a Time Like This, which I love. Um, and one of those poems begins... Dear reader, with our heels digging into the good mud at a swamp's edge, you might tell me something about the dandelion head and how it is not a flower itself, but a plant made up of many small flowers at its crown. What I love about the question of the title, how can black people write about flowers at a time like this, which I think of all, the, I probably think of the title of that poem more than I think of any other poem title in my day-to-day -day life, um, is that you're really kind of responding to the implication that Black people can't live full emotional lives, um, that we are to take our suffering with a side of suffering, with additional suffering sauce at all times. And so what are the things that, much like flowers, are you finding yourself in this time of suffering? Are there things that you're really contemplating closely right now? What are you looking at? This is a very Ross Gay channeling question, right? Like, what are you, what are you peering at closely? What are you examining? Can you invite us into examining those things with you? What are we missing here? 
Um, okay. I'm gonna, I wanna, I love that question and I'm, I'd, I'd like to answer it well. You can answer the question that's in your brain that you wanna ask and answer instead. <laughs> but I also just did like an interview about fortune and the, and the, the Lenore shit. Um, I don't mean to say shit and be dismissive, but you know, in the spirit of Hurston, I'm gonna talk how I talk, I guess. Um, but, and I, I like said a thing that I felt like wasn't honest and I, because I feel like I'm among family. I, here's what I wanna say. Um, you know those flower poems, uh, the title is one thing, but I think the body of the work is another thing. The title is me like making lemonade out of, you know, like speaking of like summoning Ross into the room, I was at a Ross Gay reading and a white woman said that phrase and I thought it was like- Ross I knew that it was, I knew it was him. And I never said out loud that it was Ross. Yeah, it was Ross. You probably, yeah, um, yeah. And like a white woman said that and I thought it was like whack, but intriguing, which, you know, most things that inspire me are whack but intriguing um but the actual body of the poems i think it bears mentioning for me was an experiment in figuring out if i could hold beauty within my ecosystem without trying to write it into something treacherous or something that i wanted to be distanced from yeah. and i worked on those poems at a time I think when I was struggling to understand what capability I had to respond to affection, mm. like just very plain affection. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's funny because I think because of the poem's title in, in poem titles and because of the way they were received in the world, they were, um, and I'm not upset about this, but they became this communal exercise among like black folks in particular. Um, but the actual work of the poems were it was very selfish and very individualistic because again, it was a question of how am I able to achieve, am I able to achieve and receive and hold beauty in, in my ecosystem without immediately attempting to distance myself from it? Um, and I guess in some ways uh, the jury is still out on that but yeah um, i was gonna ask you that and force you to answer the question about that experiment because it now um i think that that's a really i think a lot of us are really uncomfortable with that right like with the idea of be, of allowing ourselves a good thing and holding a good thing and allowing it to be a good thing without like pushing it to a distance yeah, yeah i mean so the question, how's that going for me? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we can talk about that later. <laughs> um, but I mean, yeah. you can answer that or if you want, I mean, are there things, are there things though that, that you find yourself looking at more closely as you, I mean, as you are coming out of that experiment into other kinds of experiments in your living or in your making? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I sometimes take my dog Wendy on walks and through the process of walks around our neighborhood, she will discover something really small and exciting that's very new to her. And through the discovery of that really small thing, the entire orbit around that small thing's be thing becomes new to her. You know, so if she like smells something by a pole that she's been to 50 times, she's seeing the pole anew. The pole is now a new pole. And um, I think there's something happening within my work and hopefully myself where I am inspired by Wendy stumbling upon small newnesses and allowing that to open up a larger newness into a world that I know and am sometimes displeased with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on, in, in Build Yourself a Boat, you have a poem titled No Relief, which is also a title I find myself thinking a lot about these mm -hmm. days. Um, and that poem begins, blood maps the artifice of the fictional state. The forward body is a fictional state the body happens on the line. Um, as you're thinking about this new project around political philosophies and black poetics, what do you think is missing from political discourse right now about the bodies and the blood that have made this country what it is and whose bodies are on the line right now? Knowing that this is something that um, people are talking about a lot, right? And I have a lot of thoughts about the ways the phrase, the black body has um, come to be kind of used and reconfigured in recent years that I think brings it away from the origins of 
people's intentions who first started using that phrase, but what should we be paying attention to as you are, you are a, a keen political observer. What should we be paying attention to right now about the relationship between blood and bodies and borders and politics and what's missing from that conversation? Yeah. What I'm thinking about a lot, and I think this actually has a lot to do with the, the book that I'm working on is like, when we talk about bodies in politics, we talk about them um, in a very distanced way, right? What I love, let me actually take a step back and say what I love the most about poetry, right? And about poetics that I'm, I think every day I'm trying to bring into politics is exactly what Hanif was gesturing to, right? Um, the idea of really being able to embody the minuscule, to take the small thing and to really understand how that small thing functions in the structure of the rest of the world. And I think a big part of what's missing in the way that we talk about bodies and politics is like, we're just not honest about them, right? So if we talk about um, politics and, and we, let's say we're talking about, you know, um, houselessness and, and people who are experiencing houselessness, um, we don't, we say homeless, right? Um, and we don't really talk about what it means for a body to not have access to shelter, right? That means that this body, this person is so vulnerable that they can't even be protected from the elements of weather, which is something, a right, right? Like a fundamental right that we've all grown accustomed to. Um, and we talk about bodies um, because, and, and when we talk about bodies with such distance, we aren't being honest, I guess, about the way that they truly function and what they deserve in order to be the thing that we say they are. And so in poetry, right, when we talk about a body in a poem, you can't really talk about that body, body without acknowledging in some way, shape or form, whether it is like a living body or a dead body, um, a body that is walking or a body that is still. And in politics, we don't create those distinctions, right? We don't actually acknowledge what the body is doing and how important it is that we like build a world that can affirm what it has to do. Um, and so when I think about bodies, I think about the fact that like, you, you, you have to sleep and you have to eat, right? And you have, and you need space to breathe. Um, and when I bring that thinking into politics, then what I'm thinking about is like, what are the things that get in the way of people being able to eat, to sleep and to breathe, right? And I try to work backwards from that. When I think about legislating and how we legislate, I work backwards from that question of what do bodies need? Um, and I don't think that we really do that, right? We think, we say what in politics, we say, what do people need, right? And really when we say people, we have a bunch of different definitions. We mean people who are wealthy, we mean people who have access, we mean people who don't have any access at all, but we're not thinking about like how humanity actually thrives, right? And like what we do to foster that. I don't know if this is making sense. It's a little bit convoluted, but it's- No, it's, I'm with you, I'm with you. Yeah, it's the way that my brain works every day where I'm just like, if we're going to ask a question of what we need to do to protect people, then we need to understand what it means to be to be in a body, to be in a body that lives and to actually talk about it. And I think part of why that doesn't happen in politics is because it's too expensive, right? Mm. We talk about what bodies do and how they function and what they require means that some people are gonna have to give some things up. So if we're really gonna talk about what bodies need and how they thrive, then you can't not talk about capitalism. You can't talk about the way, you can't not talk about the way that capitalism gets in the way of someone's ability to breathe and to sleep and to eat. Um, so I think that's what's missing. and. And in some ways, there's really no way to articulate it through the language of politics, right? Some of that language like specifically and uniquely belongs to poetry and to poetics, which is why I get trapped in this middle ground all the time where I'm, I'm trying to talk politic, but like they don't feel me, <laughs> you know, like they don't know what I'm actually talking about. And so I just come back to poetics and sometimes it's misaligned and sometimes people are like, this is so uh, up there. And it's like, no, you don't understand. You have to go up there to even start from the place that you want to start. Um, yeah, that's, that's a lot of what I'm thinking about. That's so powerful, man, because like, well, first of all, that's a very black feminist ethic to begin by saying, what are the basic elements of care that people require? And it's bananas to me that that remains a, a radical intervention, right? Uh, that I think that we have inherited from caretakers who came before us to, you, you really can't ask any other questions without asking that first question of like, are, are people fed, right? Are people housed, yay or nay? Um, and I think that that is um, relevant to my next question, which is that, um, you know, a, a friend of ours uh, had a, a mutual friend of ours had um, someone pass away uh, who was our age at the beginning of the pandemic. And she said something where she was like, you know, I have to accept that it was a traumatic experience to fight for my friend's life for six weeks. And I'm, I've been thinking a lot about the ways that um, 
if we were honest in every interaction, all of us are carrying so much and our basic needs are not being met in so many obvious ways. But if we were to really confront that, it would be like crushing. Um, and so this week we saw something happen that knowing both of you, I know was not a surprise to you, um, but I know it doesn't make it any less painful. And that's the failure to indict the police that killed Breonna Taylor. But I also know that both of you, and I would like to think myself, have much more expansive ideas about what justice means um, that transcends something like arrest or conviction. So I was wondering if both of you could talk a little bit about that more expansive vision you have of justice, um, beginning with, you know, come on, what you just shared with us, which is like the essentials being met. But what, is, what does justice mean to you right now? And how would you like to push forward our ways of talking about something like demanding justice? And, and if you feel up to it also, how do we get there? But if you don't, if that's too much, just like what, what is justice to you beyond Beyond what we're talking about normally. Um, can I? Yes. Okay. So I have a couple of things. One, just very, very quickly, because there's something you said that struck me about um, being honest with each other in every interaction. And since you summoned our ancestor Ross Gay into the room earlier, I want to say <laughs> that like one time I did this in conversation, I tell the story all the time, so whatever, but one time I did this in conversation with Ross Gay, and at the end of it, he was like, he put his hand on my shoulder and was like, this might be the last time we see each other. Like I could walk outside, you know, which is a very Ross thing. And the whole thing, but the whole thing was like, if we if we move through the world with the understanding that the time we're spending together may be our, our final time together, then there's a real generosity that opens up. I say that to lead into, um, I've had, a, I've been running into the wall of reconsidering punishment and particularly as an organizer on the organizing front locally with people I care about, um, not wanting to dispose of people who uh, are maybe not walking the righteous path, whatever that may be. But also I have a keen understanding of the fact that um, a system cannot hold itself accountable if it's not built for the people, right? But also, um, I've been using the word imagination a lot. And I think some of this begins at the root. To me, uh, justice means an expansive imagination of what autonomy people have, Black people in particular. I got really frustrated last night because Charles Barkley was uh, this. I watched, I usually, this is why I turn this sound off when I watch games, for one. But I, I got caught slipping. We're going to talk about Charles off. Barkley. And we well, said that, he said that old bullshit about like, well, what are black people gonna do if there aren't police? What are we, what are they? He's he such said, a clown. He said, what are we gonna do in our neighborhoods? And it's like my nigga, well, sorry for saying, sorry for saying nigga. On <laughs> Let's that. keep it going. It's the National um, Book Fountain. Everybody's gonna have to deal at this point. Lisa, like, I'm ho hopefully Lisa Lucas isn't watching and mad at me for saying <laughs> nigga. <nigga-on. laughs> um, but like, we're not talking about the same hoods. Right. We're not. Well, Charles Barkley is so, I mean, anyway, let me not continue. It's so removed, right? And so. Right. I came up on the, I came up in East Columbus. I came up on the East side of Columbus where the police would not, I came up in neighborhoods and surrounded by neighborhoods where police were not coming because it was deemed un, too unsafe for them to show up. So what do people think were ha like, what do people think were happening in those neighborhoods? Everyone immediately runs to, well, there'll be crime because everyone thinks of these hoods as like just rows of trap houses, right? And their imagination can't expand to if police aren't showing up, that means communities of care are also being braided together, right? Their imagination cannot extend to a world in which Black people care for each other under without the watch of authority. Of a state. Nor a can state. it ex extend to listening to Black people who say the who police say are actively agents, yeah. who say that's happening, who say the police actively make me feel unsafe, right? It's that was something I think about too, in terms of this. So I get really worked up about this. So I've been thinking about it all day because I am, I was like out east earlier today. I was like out in my old neighborhood and I saw people, I saw like OGs who I knew when I was a kid who still know my name and still ask about what I'm doing. And I saw the old woman whose porch people used to go to. So I'm, I'm thinking about the way that black people care for each other independent of the eyes of the state. Um, and it frustrates me to no end that when people talk about what are black people gonna do if police don't come to their neighborhoods, everything we've been doing and more, right? And so that is um, a slight diversion, but I think a form of justice and uh, maybe <laughs> with, all, with all love for me talking the way I talk among like, that I would be talking to like you and Kamon, uh, 
hopefully the National Book Foundation is okay. <laughs> no, they they have to live with it. I mean, and I don't think it's a diversion because part of the point is that in or that uh, political autonomy and self determination means the ability to redirect resources the way we want to see them redirected. But let me toss yeah. that to you, come on, because I I want to hear about your expansive vision of justice before they no, cut the line. I'm so grateful that the Hanif said what he said around autonomy, because that's all I can think of, right? I mean, yesterday when, you know, the obvious happened, which was of course going to happen, what frustrated me and, and not frustrated by the people who asked the question, but by the question, I just want to make that clear, right? Is like the question of, or people saying like, you know, justice wasn't had today, or, you know, justice, justice was evaded. We didn't get justice for Brianna. And it was like, there was no justice to begin with. Right, like there, there is no justice in this instance when a woman is killed, when a young woman, a young black woman is killed by police. It doesn't matter if they go to jail. It doesn't matter if tomorrow someone takes their lives, which I'm not advocating for and I would hope would not happen, right? But like, either way, there is no justice. Her life was taken by a system that we have so little, um, so little agency within and so little access to that like we, we can't even understand where to begin talking and thinking about justice. And I think about exactly what Hanif said, like to me, justice is a network of care, right? And a network of care that's based on and fundamentally structured within the idea of agency and autonomy, particularly for black and brown people. And exactly what you said, Eve, like the ability to redirect resources wherever we think they need to be. Um, I've been organizing more in the last couple of months than I have in a long time, which I feel really grateful to have the time for and spending a lot of time um, with um, an organization called Survived and Punished. Um, really thinking about like, you know, when people, the fact that in many ways, Black women in particular come to understand agency very early and they understand it when it's being taken from them. And in some ways, the only way that we are able to get agency in, in this space where there is no justice, right, is to deliver a measure of harm that might protect us. And what the what the prison industrial complex does and what prisons in general do is it says that like your ability to protect yourself is not valid here, right? Like we don't care about your body and we don't care that it needs to be protected. But in this poem that I write, um, I wrote recently about borders, I'm really trying to reconcile with like what it means to be a human being who has a border, right? Who understands that harm is real and that safety is also real and who wants to be located somewhere within that binary. Like I wanna be safe and also I'm okay with being unsafe and I wanna be able to have the ability, right? To like take care of myself in the way that I think I need you. And like, I'll give you an example. I'm sort of going on a tangent here, but a couple of weeks ago or like two weeks ago, I went outside to smoke a joint and uh, there was a, a there's a, um, a man who probably is suffering in many different ways, um, who seems to be houseless, who sometimes just like walks around the street, like throwing things and will sometimes chase people with a stick. He never hits them, right? It is like very, <laughs> like you already, we've seen this hundreds of times in our own communities. Like he does, he never hits them. It's just as, you know, a way of intimidating people for whatever reason. And I was out very late, it was like 2 a.m. And a young woman, a young white woman with her dog was walking and he uh, chased her and, and you know, sort of like gestured as if he was going to hit her. And she's screaming, she's terrified. And I yell out at him to like, hey, chill, leave her alone. Um, and she turns to me and she truly has no idea what to do. And so I say, just come stand next to me. I'm standing in the light. He's not going to harm both of us. Just come stand next to me. And she stands there and she's like, well, what do we do? And I was like, we stand here, that's it. And she, and she was like, really? I was like, yeah, we're not going to call the cops because that's way more trouble than it's worth. And then five minutes later, he'd gone to another block and she was just standing there with her dog and she just turned around and said, thank you. And I said, you're welcome. Have a great night. And that in, in such a quick second, in five minutes, that was exactly what justice was and needed to look like. It was me extending care and extending my network of care in the best way that I knew how. It was me anticipating his motive and anticipating that because he's probably unwell and houseless, that he's looking for some sort of affirmation, some sort of attention, his own agency, and the realization that there was nobody else in that, in that space at that time who was better fitted to take care of me and this other person than me. So I just did it. 
Um, and so and so badly what I want is for systems to get out of the way so that people can embody that information that we already have, that intuitive information. I want us to step into that because if I hadn't been there, right, and she had truly felt like she was without community, of course she would have called the cops because that's what she, that's all she thinks she has, but it's, it's not what she has. And so I guess I say all that to say that like my vision of justice is a world where we understand that we really do have each other, right? And that we really can lean on each other for some of the most basic resources that we think we can only rely on systems for. And I want a world where that mutual reliance, that inter that intercommunal reliance is like legislated and dictated, right? And like actually is put in place where that is the system and the only system and all of the other systems are born from that. Um, but also mm-hmm. systems too. So, and also like resourced, right? Because it's really unfortunate that in that moment, you as an individual don't have, like you have to, you, you are the only resource that you have in that moment, which is powerful, but it's also like, we don't fund any. So my version of that story is like, I live on a block where people regularly at two in the morning, like to post up in front of my house and have parties and I'm very washed, right? I need to sleep. I'm a person who needs a lot of sleep. And it really frustrates me. And I don't call the police. Nobody on my block calls the police, but I also would like to sleep. And so it really frustrates me that I don't have, that the two options I have are not sleeping or terror murder squad comes and maybe kills somebody. And I'm like, I would just like, so I would like to spend a fraction of this money to an option of someone I can call who will allow me to sleep and like exercise and who allow all the people in our community to sleep and to enforce a community norm of like, hey, y'all three want to have this party, but there's a whole bunch of other people who live here who have children and jobs and want to go to bed uh, without it being like the murder death squad, right? Yeah. And that's messed up to me that there's no money for the middle, the middle ground. 100%. And what's even more messed up too, I think, is that like, some communities have figured out, like to Honey's point earlier, figured out how to create the middle ground because real talk, the cops are not showing up. But like those systems that get established get completely decimated, right? Once the cops decide that there's some benefit to them showing up. So even in my hood, I'm, you know, I'm from the Bronx. I'm from like deep in the Bronx, right? Like same shit, Eve. Like, of course it's Saturday night. My mom is trying to sleep. Music is real loud. But there's somebody on the block, somebody in my building who is fearless and will go knock on that door. And they know that when that knock comes, they know exactly which big homie it is from down the block. And they know the kind of way he carries and that he's really not playing. And what they finna do, turn that music down. <laughs> I've always told Damon, my husband makes fun of me because I'm always like, just go tell them that we have a baby. And he's like, we don't have a baby. I'm like, just invent. I just want people to be able to feel bad for me and my fictional <laughs> newborn baby. That's always what I'm like, just tell them we have a newborn Just invent an infant. Just invent an infant. I also do that on the bus when dudes try to talk to me. I'm like, you know, I got to go pick up my kids. <laughs> I have so many fictional kids. Anyway, uh, for those of you watching at home, um, this is a five minute check in for the fact that you will be going to Q&A soon. And so um, please use the ask a question feature uh, in your chat box if you have a question. Um, I had seven more questions for y'all, but I'm going to jump to I'm going to ask you two mildly less depressing and devastating questions um, with no segue. So here we go. Um, The first one, so my my stepdad under normal circumstances is a a security guard at the United Center and he has recently in quarantine times started making beaded jewelry. Um, Our friend, poet Franny Choi has started sewing all of these clothes for herself. Um, My favorite is um, poet Devin Samuels whose Instagram handle is poetry Devin has made the new account Pottery Devin, he is <laughs> making pottery. So now I ask you, friends, tell us about your random quarantine hobbies. Lay it on us. Well, like I mean, uh, other than like the piano thing, I feel like my quarantine hobbies are just my normal. Like I am still buying too many records. Um, I am still boring people with really intricate talk about like 80s pop music. Um, have you bought any, Have you? do you have any like um, extravagant quarantine purchases that you like to confess? Not really, I mean sneakers. Stop lying, honey, if you're a damn lie, come on now. I mean sneakers, but sneakers that I can't really wear anywhere is the thing, you know, that's a big one. Um, also like I own a house now and so I spend a lot of time doing landscaping projects that I don't really understand. 
where it's just like, <laughs> I'm going to like pull up all the grass and then the grass is up and it's like, okay, well now I don't know what to do. And so like there's stuff like that where it's like, I'm going to paint this room. And then I get halfway through and I'm like, oh, that's not the color. Ha- like early on, I decided I was going to build picture frames, which was ridiculous. And so I was in Michael's for a full weekend and my homies were like, you know, I texted a homie. It was like during the early in the NBA playoffs and my homie hit me and was like, you know, you're going to catch this fourth quarter. And I was like, yeah, I'm at Michael's right now. And he was like, Michael who? And I'd be like, oh, no, no, I'm at the craft store fan. Uh, and so it was a real confusing time. Anyway, all that to say, most of my hobbies have remained, um, you know, I started, I, I will say that I started a, a pen pal thing with, I have people who know me know this. I have um, at least two clinically clinical anxiety disorders, but probably more at this point. So I started this uh, pen pal group for other people who have anxiety disorders and live alone. And so we just email each other really short emails and sometimes just pictures and sometimes just playlists. And that's been fun. That's amazing. I also have a pen pal. My pen pal is um, Ezekiel Kwiku, your former MTV News My colleague God. and now recently yeah. appointed New York uh, and, and or many of you may know him as the shrillest on Twitter. And we've just been we send each other really long emails about Star Wars <laughs> <laughs> doing that for six months. Uh, thank you, Hanif. I didn't think to it was like, oh, yeah, that's pen pal pen paling. Um, come on. Do you have any quarantine hobbies? Or quarantine yeah. extravagant purchases oh, random and re- i mean i was gonna i was laughing to myself because i was like this is actually like the perfect question for hanif and i because we have very similar answers which like mostly is like i'm spending way too much money on shit i can't wear it's real simple but uh, other than that other than spending fucking money i have been playing more video games which has been nice because i fucking love video games and it was such a big part of my culture um, as a teen and a young person, and it's been like harder to get into. And what do you, what are you playing? Can you share? Can you share with us? I am, I'm. This is really embarrassing. I I thought I liked The Sims on the computer more, but I discovered it on PS4, and for some reason, I just like it more. I don't know why. It doesn't make any sense. It's harder to fucking do. It is harder. I don't really like con. I I prefer console gaming to. I mean, because it's yeah, everything there's is something a- tactile about it. Yeah. That I- appreciate right and i'm also playing um uh, assassin's creed origins because it's nice. the hardest one i think and has been very hard to na- navigate and i don't like to be defeated and i just can't i can't get to the other island and i can't i have to get there before i can stop so that's what i'm doing but i'm also like to the point earlier of like setting goals for relationships i'm spending a lot of time like i don't know when i became a person who like isn't good at intimacy especially like intimacy with friends but I, I looked up after like a, a two years of just being on campaigns and I was like oh my god I don't know how to be a friend and so I'm spending a lot of time trying to be like like literally I'll like text a friend who's here in DC and be like do you want to like get a coffee walk or something with masks and it's so cute and weird but I spend a lot of time just like thinking about how to build intimacy again and like create communities so it's weird and sometimes it happens in letters or notes or like just sending photos to people and or like going on Instagram and asking people to ask questions and then answering them. I don't fucking know. Uh, but yeah, a, a lot of that. Adult friending is really hard under normal circumstances and these are suboptimal. These are suboptimal circumstances. So I just realized that I'm an adult. Yeah, sorry, G. <laughs> it, and guess what? It, don't, it only goes in one it direction. <laughs> it's not going back. Um, although our generation is the generation of like, I mean, maybe this is ever, maybe this is an age. I asked it, I asked my husband this the other day. I'm like, is it an age effect or a cohort effect that yeah. when you get to a certain age, you start like re- reverting to the things you wanted to do when you were 12? Um, I'm going to ask you one more question and then we're going to pivot to audience questions. My final question is, um, this is, it's fall. So this is normally the big book season for everybody. And this is a really, really hard time for authors, especially debut authors, because folks can't tour and everybody has Zoom fatigue. Um, so is there anybody you really want to shout out whose work uh, we should be looking for in the fall book season? Um, Kevin Latimer's Zotrope is a book that I- I love a lot and have loved. Um, I mean, I guess it just got, it, I mean, it just got long listed for poetry, so it's not really under the radar anymore, but I love The Age of Phyllis, the Honoré Jeffers book, and I'd loved it for such a long time. You know, it was one of those things where, like, I think I got it, like, back in February, before, maybe right before it dropped, and I was like, this is... <laughs> That's that book. Book. That's that book. 
Yeah. This is the most important book I've ever read, maybe. You know what I mean? I was just like, yeah. this is incredible. Uh, it's like an actual monument. Um, and it took years and years and years and years yeah. to write. And Honoré, give her all the flowers. For the folks at the National Book Foundation who are listening, I just, I'm just, I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't have any sway, but it, that is a real good book. It is a really good book and everybody Some, should check it out. And I, I mean, people who know me know that I'm a big Khadijah Queen disciple. You know, Khadijah Queen is uh, just like, I feel like sometimes my poetic lineage, the poetic lineage I built for myself skips like straight from Hayden to Khadijah Queen, <laughs> even though that's not true, but it sometimes feels like, like Hayden Queen, that's it. And so her new book, Anodyne is, 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 um, really immense come on how about you who should we be checking for this um, fall? i mean i was going to start with anodyne and khadijah queen because like what the fuck <laughs> it's so and and same honey like it's it's so interesting i feel like rarely these days do i get the question about like literary lineage and for and it now i just can't get it out of my mind i'm like it's gwendolyn brooks and khadijah queen i don't know what else to tell you that's all i've got and ross ross and, snuck and in ross. Yes. Ross, Ross snuck in. Yes. Um, well, yeah. you could do worse than those folks and Hayden. And also one more person I want to shout out is Hafisa. Uh, her book on American oh, yeah. is either coming out or has already like no one has supported black poets and supported black poets and their and their work and their endeavors more than Hafisa, whether it was through Haymarket or at Poets House. And I just like I just want to give her all of the love and just buy the shit out of that book, please. Also, she's an incredible writer and this shit is about to be bomb. I just know it, so. Well, thank you. And I encourage everybody to look for those books at your local bookstore or library. Um, great. Well, I have a few questions here and we have a little bit of time to answer some of them. Um, why don't we start with Hanif? Would you, uh, people would like to know about your skincare routine, Come on, if you also would like to talk about your skincare routine, this is a time to do so. If you have visual aids, <laughs> hopefully this is all sponsored content and you can get yeah, some literally. kickbacks for this free free advertisement. I know, I know we keep knocking on the door of Ross, which tells me that I should email him perhaps after this, but has anyone, he has this interview where someone asked him uh, how good he is at basketball. <laughs> And his response begins with, this is the most important question of my life. <laughs> and I feel like uh, my skincare, this is the most important question of my life. I can't really go. So I have, um, this feels very intimate, but as, and I feel like I'm known for my vulnerability. So I'm going to push through this. Um, so I have a lot of things and I'll just condense them in the morning. I do um, like a kind of standard wash and then I work out. And then post-workout, I do an oil wash and then like a, a like cream uh, and then sunscreen because as I learned like last month, uh, if you don't use sunscreen, all the skincare just gets undone. So yeah, you know, and black people, we can get skin cancer. Absolutely. It is a live white um, supremacy that we do not need sunscreen. And then in the nighttime, I do like a revitalizing face wash. Uh, and then I have a night cream and then I have an under eye cream. And then two times a week, um, I have these masks that I rock with. And then once a week, I have this like exfoliating oil scrub. Um, and that is my routine. If people want to talk about my beard routine, we can do that another time. It's much more involved. Will you post these things on Instagram for us to refer to later, potentially? No? OK, I tried. I tried, questioner. Um, Kamon, do you feel like giving free advertisement to these companies or? Oh, you're muted, boo. No, okay. but <laughs> yeah. no, thank but, you. But I will, if anyone is like, like very, very interested, I will do a very short Instagram story about it sometime this weekend. So that you all are so kind, so <laughs> kind, so generous. Um, okay, has either of you rewatched a series or a show or a movie? We can throw that into. And what was it, and does it hold up? For, listen, I'm a. <laughs> Is it, are you going to say Friday Night Lights? Lights? <laughs> racist as hell. Friday Night Lights, when it gets to the like, Friday Night Lights is like, and Season I still, four, you mean? Is the, or yeah, just so, general, yeah. 
first off, nothing holds up well. I'm not romantic. I am romantic in a lot of ways. So I'm not romantic enough to believe that anything holds up well. But Friday Night Lights is like diet racist when in the first few seasons. But then when East Dillon comes into the picture, it is like, <laughs> holy shit. You know what I mean? Because the whole conceit around East Dillon is like, this is where all the Black people have been the whole time and everyone's afraid of them. Like literally everyone. You know, there's like radio interviews, like how, how are we going to go out there and play them? The, and there's police sirens. Like every it's time also crazy because how big can Dylan really be? Right. Right. Dylan is a good 20 square blocks. I mean. And every time there's a scene in East Dylan, there's like fucking police sirens. You know, it's like <laughs> no matter what else is going on, it's police sirens. And the, literally season four starts with Michael B. Jordan running from the police. It was, it was weird because I hadn't seen Friday Night Lights in a long time. And I wanted to rewatch it because last year um, I notoriously got into like there was this thing where in Toronto um someone asked me during a Q&A what fictional television character would vote for Trump and I was like coach Taylor um and because there were like 400 people at that reading the word of that got out and then it was just like a madhouse I'm like people were emailing me I was like y'all must have a different relationship with coach Taylor than I do because my man was like people think coach Taylor is their real dad it's me I'm people okay (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I, I can own that it's okay anyway that's mine um that was that was my experience Ramon, what have you rewatched or binged so i've been rewatching and binging two different so girlfriends which i agree with you honey generally nothing really holds up but i gotta say girlfriends is like not it does I mean, it kind of does yeah, and i think true. living single also holds yeah, up i just agreed I, I agree and i think part of and you know not to be a black supremacist but i'm just gonna <laughs> i think part of the reason why it holds up is because when black people write shit they are fucking honest right mm-hmm. and also like write characters in a way that is honest and dynamic and dimensional and so like even tony like tony is one of the best characters on that show because she's so flawed and that that ability to be so flawed in her character actually is like so intriguing and so necessary. And and in many ways, like she drives every single episode and like the affect that she creates is what everything is written around. And she's, it's just like so interesting to see how fucked up and amazing she is. And like, she like hates people who are poor and like hates the idea that she might be poor, but like is so you can see that she's like so small inside and so broken and like so desperate for intimacy. And it's like things that she feels most intimate with because of that like classist framework that she's gotten trapped into. That shit holds up like a motherfucker. So that, um, but also euphoria, which like, obviously we don't really have to talk about it holding up. I'm so scared of, I'm scared to watch it. I I really enjoy rewatching that series because Mm. Something in me, I think, is like calling to writing some stuff for the screen, which, and whenever I feel like called to enter new mediums, I spend a lot of time just thinking about it. So I'll probably think about it for another three years before I actually write something. But Euphoria is like one of those shows that just like draws me in. And I'm just like, how fucking incredible to be able to represent such an, such a, a, a sort of like, monolithic world something that is like so accessible that we've all touched in some way shape or form for it to for it to feel so otherworldly and out of this world it just i really wow it's just really excellent so i've also been rewatching girlfriends and i will say that like um so i used to we don't have to get too deep into this but i used to <laughs> very much be in love with the idea of golden brooks because i don't know her as a person um yeah. And once I like saw her in person from a distance and I don't normally get starstruck, but I had a real moment where I was like, what could I possibly say to this woman? You know, like <laughs> there's nothing literally, you know, this is like three years ago and I'm not going to go up to Golden Brooks and be like, would you like to read some sad poems? You know? And so <laughs> I'm not going to go up to Golden Brooks and be like, do you want to go on a date? So like, you know, the time, um, the time has passed us by, but Golden Brooks, if you are watching. If you're watching, but please he, get on Honey's smash up album of Golden gospel Brooks. and email standards. Yeah. And also, I don't know, Honey, if you might have a little, she does actually like sad poems. So she was a Does judge. She? Yeah. She was a judge at Brave New Voices in 2018. What? I know. Like, wow. She, wow. She judged, she judged semis, which I think is really saying something, right? Like, she didn't even judge finals. She didn't even judge finals. She judged wow. semis. And you know that really? that is wow. the rest. That's love. That, 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 that means. That's love. Love. That's love. Yeah, that person is like very present. And semis is where all the sad poems come out. You got to yeah. bring out tears if you want that 10. And she, and she was really into it. So I don't know. You might have something. 
This is, wow. Well, this is an important revelation that I think is historic for all of us to witness, quite frankly. I was odds are, I think odds are pretty good that she, if I had to guess what are the odds that she's watching this right now, I would say 87%. Now I'm no Nate Silver, or am I? Um, I'm going to ask one last question and then we're going to say farewell to the, for, to the evening. Um, it is not, an, it could be an uplifting question. I don't know. Um, how are you all coping with fear? Um, the, the questioner said, how do you deal with fear doing the process of creating your work, whatever fear means to you, but we can extend it beyond work. Uh, how are you or how might we think about fear in this very uh, fearful moment before we say goodbye? Thanks for that. I am feeling, so two things. I am not doing well with dealing with fear in my own work. Hence like the frantic text I'm sending Eve of like, do you have time to hop on a phone? I really need help. I don't know how to write this one. So there's that. And I'm just literally avoiding it. I just sort of put it in the closet and run away from it. But in the rest of my life outside of work, I'm viewing fear as like a violence to myself. So instead of like being afraid of the fact that my body is changing and I'm getting a little thicker, I'm like, that fear is me harming myself. So instead I'm gonna like go th do things that make me feel good, like go to Pilates and run, right? Which is not necessarily to say that like, I will no longer have this anxiety around getting bigger or thicker, but just that like, if I think about that fear as a violence, then I have to do something that like mitigates that violence and that is kind. And so I've been a lot kinder to myself because I've been really afraid. So, yeah. I like um, kindness as an antidote to fear, as opposed to like strength or power, but kindness, yeah. tenderness. Yeah. I think, and I see her on the back on Kimon's wall, but truly anyone who knows me at all knows that I'm like just a massive Toni Morrison disciple. And, um, you know, Miss Morrison means um, more to me than any ancestor, not just as an Ohioan, but as uh, a writer, as someone who's fortunate enough to, to like work if I believe that we're all working alongside each other as writers and I was fortunate to work alongside Toni Morrison for the small time it was and her relationship to fear was kind of that she didn't have any time for it and that her understanding of fear was that um, the antidote to that for her was to embrace this wild unknown and through the embracing of that unknown to be generous with the stumbles that, that come through that embrace. And um, I'm trying to remember that, I think, because I am, um, the big reason that I started baking, I think early in the pandemic is because I knew it was something I wasn't good at. And I didn't really, and the, the stakes were so low, it didn't matter if I got good at it. You know, if I fucked up a cake in my house alone, no one's gonna care. And so, I'm embracing being reminded of the many ways I can fail and not harm others or the many ways that I can fail and not even feel shame. Um, and I think that that is my antidote to fear in that, you know, like, yeah, I'm, I am too flawed and too anxious. I mean, literally too anxious, clinically too anxious um, to get wrapped up in the fear, in fear being something that is prohibitive. And the only way I can survive is not just a creative, but a person is to understand that fear is something that is propelling me towards, uh, propelling me eagerly towards a great unknown in which I might learn something better about myself. Thank you both for that. And it strikes me in both of your answers, the way that, um, intimacy can be provoked by fear, right? Because both of these, both of these means of addressing fear re require us to either be more intimate with ourselves or with the people who, who have our backs, who are waiting to catch us in our fear. Um, I am so grateful to live and work alongside both of you all and to call you friends. And um, I hope that people that are watching um, take an opportunity to reach out to the people that love you and care about you and to make sure that you're making space to care for yourself um, during a really draining time and um, making it okay to talk about that. Um, and also thank you for supporting the Decatur Book Festival and the National Book Foundation. I really, really encourage you to purchase the incredible books written by Kamon Felix and Hanif Abdurraqib. And um, that's it, that's all we got. They're gonna show you a short video 
um, to say farewell. Um, but we really hope that you're taking care of yourselves and one another. Love Bye. you. Both. Thank you, Kimono. So Abolish police. Okay. Bye. Police. Love you both. Thank <laughs> you.